Welcome to the Mindspace Podcast. I'm Joe Flanders. Thanks for tuning in. The Mindspace Podcast is my personal exploration of the science and practice of well-being. We now know that well-being is actually a skill, and I want to inspire as many people as possible to become more skillful. Join me as I discover the most impactful insights about human flourishing from leading experts. My guest today is Susan Woods. Susan is a senior mindfulness teacher and teacher trainer. She's been training health professionals since 2005 and developed the professional certification programs at the Mindfulness-Based Professional Training Institute at UC San Diego and the Center for Mindfulness Studies in Toronto. Susan and I spoke in depth about contemporary mindfulness and its relationship with Buddhism. We explored the ways in which mindfulness-based programs align with and sometimes diverge from traditional Buddhist teachings. We covered the place for ethics and values in mindfulness-based programs, the role of the teacher and their own meditation practice, and the state of the art of training mindfulness teachers. It's really hard to find someone better placed to comment on the origins and evolution of contemporary mindfulness. Susan has been particularly innovative and impactful in the area of inquiry, and she just published a book on the topic with her co-authors Pat Rockman and Evan Collins. The book is called Mindfulness-Based Cognitive Therapy, Embodied Presence and Inquiry in Practice. Susan, Pat, and Evan will be in Toronto for a book launch on June 18th. Should be an exciting event. And I'm also excited to share that Susan and Pat will be at Mindspace in Montreal in October for a two-day training on inquiry. Links to both of those events will be available in the show notes for this episode. If you're interested in Susan's MBSR or MBCT facilitation certificate, Mindspace is pleased to offer them in collaboration with the Center for Mindfulness Studies. For more information, please check the Professional Development tab at mindspacewellbeing.com. And if you're interested in following a mindfulness-based stress reduction, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, or mindful self-compassion program for yourself, please visit the Mindfulness Training tab at mindspacewellbeing.com. Susan Woods, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Joe. It's uh, a real delight to be here. Okay, maybe you can start us off by um, telling us what you do Mm -hmm. and where you come from. Okay. Okay. All right. So what do I do? Um, uh, Well, currently, um, I am involved in training future teachers in mindfulness-based stress reduction, as well as mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. I'm a supervisor, a mentor, a senior faculty at the Center for Mindfulness Studies, and have had the joy and the challenge as well um, in uh, being a part of developing the uh, professional training program at uh, UC San Diego at the Mindfulness-Based Professional Training Institute. So the training, the professional training in um, MBSR and and MBCT. And um, have also been asked to consult on, on various other projects to do with um, developing the field of of mindfulness Um, and have also had the opportunity to be involved as a consultant on various research projects. Um, More more sort of recently I've had the delight of of writing a a book um, uh, about MBCT for teachers who are interested in developing their skills and I um, wrote that book with uh, Pat Rockman who is the uh, clinical director as well as the director of professional training at the Centre for Mindfulness Studies in Toronto and then also with Evan Collins who is a a psychiatrist who is also involved in uh, offering um, trainings through the Centre for Mindfulness Studies. So um, it's been pretty busy, let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I'd like to hear um, a little bit about how you got into this role or these various roles. Um, I think you have a, 
uh, an interesting background. So I know that you are a social worker, but you've done a bunch of other stuff. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, sure. Um, so when I came to the, the States um, in 1983, the original uh, agreement that I had with my wonderful partner, my husband, was that we would be here for three years and then we would return to the UK. Um, and, um, well, it's now 2019, so that didn't happen. Um, and really that was the, um, I suppose, the engine that um, placed me in a, um, a different um, frame of reference. You know, I was now going to be here in the U.S. for a longer period of time. Uh, I was a uh, prof qualified physiotherapist, UK trained, had been working as a, a physiotherapist in England um, in various hospitals um, and in various practices and uh, had had all my um, qualifications, my UK qualifications transcribed into the American system. And all I needed to do was just to sit um, uh, the licensing that was required to for me to you know um, to offer um, my my professional uh, ability here in in the U.S. But I also had an opportunity to uh, have an introduction to two MDs, and um, they basically dissuaded me from. <laughs> Uh, working as a, it would be a, a physical therapist here in, in the U.S. because there were some pretty big differences at that time um, between the two trainings. And um, basically, as a U.K. physiotherapist, I had more autonomy than um, PTs had at, at that time. So that um, made me realize that... Um, you know, I could perhaps look, you know, in have a wider frame um, of reference. And I'd always been interested in the mind-body connection. As a, as a physiotherapist, I was often seeing uh, an emotional component to um, physical uh, disease and physical injuries and became very interested in, in, in that association. Um, so I... Um, applied to a, um, a PhD uh, program at New York University uh, in uh, school psychology and I uh, was lucky enough to be accepted and did a year there and realized that um, the fit really wasn't such a, a great fit um, for me. And so I uh, moved up to Columbia University again in, in New York City and uh, did their two-year um, clinical master's program in, in social work, which was fantastic. Um, and very much more uh, reflective of my interest and understanding about us as social beings in context, in our environments, as well as, of, of course, our um, personalities, uh, how we make meaning in life, what contributes to that experience, what contributes to mental health issues. And um, graduated from there, then went on to do actually an advanced clinical training back at, uh, at NYU um, uh, for clinical social workers and really enjoyed that. And at the time, I had already had a... Um, a yoga practice. I'd, I'd started that in the in the UK, um, and had found that incredibly beneficial for me personally. And as I um, started to work as a as a clinical social worker, I began to hear about the work of you know John Kabat-Zinn and um, the Center for Mindfulness at UMass, and was lucky enough to um, be a participant in, um, I think it was the second training that they offered. It was an internship at that point. They really hadn't developed a training pathway. Um, and, you know, that sort of was really a synthesis of both um, the yoga practice that led me into a, a meditation practice in the 
uh, tradition of the Vipassana. And I was suddenly seeing that there was now this ability, along with my um, clinical work, to synthesize something that, that was deeply meaning for, for me, which was these, this combination of both the yoga practice, meditation in movement, meditation in action, and then the Vipassana. And uh, so, you know, that sort of opened some, some doors for me at my local hospital. I was able to teach the MBSR program and, and basically, Joe, you know, things happened as a result of, of doing that. I mean, I, I continued to have a very um, busy clinical practice, but I was now also offering uh, the Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Program, seeing this um, wonderful benefit um, that people seem to, to be um, experiencing as a result of taking the program. Um, I was a real novice, so it was, you know, me learning as I was teaching, um, there was no supervision at that time. There was no mentorship. Um, m my participants seemed to do okay. And I was learning a ton from, you know, really having the ability to, to work with them as they were developing you know, the practices that I was offering uh, through the MBSL program. And I was, you know, it was contributing to my own practice. So it was really reciprocal, which was truly wonderful. So that, that's really what happened. And as a result of that, I then got asked to work with uh, Zindel Siegel, who's one of the co-founders of the uh, Mindfulness-Based Cognitive Therapy Program. Um, I uh, was the therapist to lead two of the first cohorts through a, a clinical study that he was doing in Toronto. And then he and I started to teach together. So we started teaching together in 2005, I guess. And then that led to um, me becoming much more involved in, you know, how do you train future teachers? Um, what does the structure look like? What are the components? How do we bring this, this aspect of both personal practice because we are asking those teachers who want to teach a mindfulness-based program that actually the one of the probably the major engines around being able to deliver um, a mindfulness-based program is to have a practice of your own whatever that looks like that there are some parameters that we can we can suggest and, and uh, support in terms of developing that and then also having a, a structure, a protocol or a curriculum that gives a basis for um, new teachers to, to uh, have a, um, a map or uh, it's not really, a, well, a map. We ha I have to be a bit careful about a map because it's two by two dimensional. And I always think of maps as a, a way to start. But then as you go into the territory, you're you know, you're finding your way into the material. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that, and then, you know, other things happen. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I can't tell you, Joe, that I, I had a, a, a sense of how this was all going to, um, to be. I just, uh, I don't know. I, 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 would, I was, I don't know. I was lucky. Um, I was interested. Um, uh, I found I was learning as I was being asked to do uh, all these different projects and different trainings. And again, this is the same reciprocity. It's not a one way, you know, practice is not a one way thing. It's this inner awakening, this inner awareness, and then the context in which you're delivering. And so then you're being acted upon by the context and the people. And uh, it, it, um, it's very sustaining and life-giving. Right. Um, your experience being um, an early trainee at mm. CFM I yeah. think is, is very interesting. Uh -huh. And I, th like, I have the impression that that, um, you know, positions you in, in a, 
in a particular way, meaning um, you've been studying this for a long time. You were very close to um, the founders, or let's say the founder, um, and the intentions that went into developing the curriculum and then um, delivering it uh, to the public. And um, if I understand, I mean, you had a yoga, yoga practice and you're particularly interested in, to use your word, the sort of synthesis between these different ways of um, being, these different kinds of experiences, different um, approaches to understanding the mind, etc. cetera. Mm. Um, so I'm just curious how you think about um, this convergence, like, you have clinical training in a fairly traditional Western scientific way, but you also have a Dharma background. Yeah. How, do you, how do you think about mindfulness-based programs um, and this intersection? So the intersection between the, you know, tr- the more traditional form of uh, meditation practice and then how that has uh, come into um, our you know, our Western world and particularly the fusion with Western psychology. Is that what you're sort of asking? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Goodness. Yeah. Yeah, Nice, easy one to warm you up. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you know, that's, I mean, that is a, it's, it's a, it's a question that, um, uh, the, the more traditional, uh, form of meditation. So, uh, you know, the, the Dharma teachers are asking of those of us who are offering mindfulness-based programs, and indeed, um, those of us who are offering mindfulness-based programs. You know what? What? What is it that we're we teaching? What if, and and how how can we maintain um, uh, the sort of the ethics of, of what we're what we're teaching? You know. Yes, um, you're definitely on the right track in terms of yeah. what I'm curious about. Yeah, yeah. So it's a bit. This is a a big question. Um, I, I think if what what we're what we're saying um, is if we can hold it in a in a a, a bigger frame, which is that um, we're de- both traditions are offering a, spe- a specific awareness or a specific form of awareness. I mean, there's awareness and then there's thinking and there's emotion and there's body sensations, but there's this, this mindfulness is pointing to um, awakening or, or becoming aware and becoming an aw- aware in a way that um, is asking us to spend time in the present moment as best we can. So I don't think there's any difference in in the ethos for both of those traditions, we're both we're both really we're, we're asking people to engage in their lives um, from a an understanding of an interiority. Um, so how 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 that appears when we practice in a in a specific way, and how often we are governed by a stream of thinking, which often leads to an emotional context, which can then play out in the body and behaviors. And then the context in which those get um, operationalized, if you like. And there's the formal practice in the tradition of um, Buddhism. And then there's an aspect of that that we can really offer those participants who come to our MBSR programs and those patients who come to MBCT programs, we're um, giving them a taste of what um, we all have inside of us. It's not something that we have to, you know, build. Um, It's already there. And the practices of mindfulness just open those doors and make them more available and I think that that contributes to the well-being of a participant or a patient 
Um, but it also then uh, contributes to the well-being of, of the world in which we live in because it asks us to be thoughtful about how we treat ourselves, which is self-care, and then how we contribute to the way that we hold our relationships. Um, and that, of course, would be to our family, to our friends, to our colleagues, and then to our neighbors and to the world itself. It doesn't stop with um, us. And that, those principles are the principles of the tradition on which MBSR and MBCT is built. Buddhism, though, though, those are uh, inherent um, precepts, if you like, from, from the tradition of Buddhism, but they are very much a part um, of the skill that a teacher offers to uh, a person who comes into an MBSR or an MBCT training, eight-week training. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, I think that was a, a lovely framing of it. Um, mm -hmm. What's interesting, though, is that you know, someone who gets referred, let's say, to my center, who, yeah. let's say, gets a referral from their physician or, or a sort of a word-of-mouth recommendation from a friend, mm -hmm. very stressed, um, something's going on yeah. in their life, and they want to do a mindfulness-based stress reduction program. Mm -hmm. And here you are talking about um, learning a practice that helps them take care of themselves, which makes sense. But you're then introducing how they relate to other aspects of their lives. And it starts to feel a lot broader mm -hmm. and it starts to sound a lot more Buddhist um, and even ethical. I don't know if we can use that word, but certainly potentially. Mm -hmm. um, and so somehow it becomes more than a clinical intervention. It becomes an introduction to the Dharma in a way. Um, but it's all implicit. Um, and I, you know, I do think that, you know, there's this the critique of the mindfulness movement as kind of stealth uh, Buddhism. Um, so, so is this a Dharma training or is it a health program or um, are, are we, is there some kind of like bait and switch happening with our participants when we introduce this kind of awareness training? Hmm. Well, see, I don't, the, I, this, this is where I, I would see the Dharma as a big mystery. Big, it's a big mystery. How it unfolds. Um, it, it, for me, the, the Dharma is about a lot of things, but not least the alleviation of, of suffering in all its forms. Can you, for, for the people that yeah. aren't very clear on what the word Dharma means, um, before we talk about how mysterious it is, <laughs> can we at least agree on, on the well, meaning of the word? Well, simply, you know, the, the Dharma is, is, a, is a, a way of... Um, conducting oneself in, in the world, I mean, simply put. Um, and in that way, it would be no, no different from other uh, religious traditions. It, 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 it asks us to be thoughtful um, uh, about um, how we understand suffering. And um, in Buddhism, it, it makes some explicit suggestions that there's a way that we can understand it and alleviate it. And there's a path that, that we can um, uh, invite ourselves to, to uh, play a part um, and for us to uh, thoughtfully engage in. So and, it yeah. sounds like you're talking about the Dharma as the teachings of the Buddha or the... Hmm the wisdom in Buddhism. Is that fair? It, it, that, that, would be, that would be correct, yes. Okay. Now, when you come to um, look at MBSR, I, I, I would 
you know, question this idea that um, there's something in, implicit um, about what, what we're teaching. Because I think if, if what we're saying is that in the case of MBSR, somebody is stressed or they're anxious or um, yeah, they, they, they're recognizing something about their lives that, that is um, troubling and, and concerning for them and challenging, um, and they they self refer uh, or they get a um, a referral from their physician to come into the MBSR program. They first of all want to have a path that helps them understand how to um, work with um, stress, the way they perceive it, um, and the way they relate to it, and eventually to have through that understanding to mitigate some of their symptoms if not all of them and uh, have a path to prevent um, it the whatever form of suffering they're experiencing take such a hold um, in their lives that produces these symptoms of discomfort anxiety, sadness, anger, wh whatever it is. And I think that both MBSR and more specifically MBCT, but MBSR really addresses that. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it the Dharma because it's not the Dharma as in Buddhism, but it's, it's saying here are some ways that we can offer you through these practices to develop a different relationship. To suffering, which is actually one of the ways that um, makes suffering a lot worse. <laughs> um, we're not going to escape the vicissitudes of life. There is going to be stress in our lives. That's part of being a human being. And um, through developing awareness, so I would, you know, substitute the Dharma and say awareness. Through developing awareness, we can... Um, offer ourselves um, a way to understand how much of suffering we, um, uh, what's the word? Let me just give it a little bit of, so I'm going to back out of just what I said um, and go back to the, the MBSR program has this, way of of um, unpacking suffering, which is very much a part of the Dharma, but it doesn't need to be called the Dharma. So I think sometimes the discussion gets um, can get a little bit bogged down in the semantics of the word. You know, the, I see the Dharma as um, the foundation for a lot of my understanding, but actually, what has, you know, my I still practice, Joe, is every time I sit on the cushion or every time I have a moment where, you know, I, I go, uh-oh, I'm getting, <laughs> getting attached to this or mm, I'm getting some activation, that's practice. And it's this practice of understanding how I can contribute to making things worse or I can alleviate the situation, or I can bring some stillness or equanimity to a situation, and so not contribute to any escalation. And I think it's that that we, one of the things we offer through teaching MBSR. So I, I don't worry so much about, is it the Dharma? Is it Dharma light? Um, I look at this as a, a, the a, a sort of a concept I have, which is there's suffering in the world. And, you know, I've been, I was a physiotherapist for 10 years. Then for something like 22 or 23 years, I had an active clinical practice in which I was teaching MBSR and MBCT. So I've seen the physical components of, of um, disease. I've seen the mental components of disease. And I've seen how people um, want to have a tool um, and MBSR is one of the tools, MBCT is another, um, to 
um, find a way f for their own wisdom and their own understanding to develop so that then they uh, have some relief, some freedom from what contributes to an initial um, condition. So whether that's, you know, the loss of, of a dear one, whether it's uh, a loss of a job, um, it can be stressful to have a, a, you know, a baby born, you know, your, your first child or your second child. I mean, there are so many aspects of, of life that uh, can really challenge us. But at its deepest, I think the MBSR really allows people to trust their own wisdom and understanding in terms of how they relate to what in Buddhist term is the first arrow and then that second arrow is that, you know, what we then bring to the situation. So I think it's beautiful from, from that perspective. And I, I don't worry about, you know, whether it's the Dharma or not. What I do worry about is I want my future teachers to have a practice because that embodiment of wherever they are in their practice um, is a contributing factor in terms of the transmission of um, how we can hold uh, moments of difficulty and challenge through the practice. Does that, so, does that answer? I've gone on for a long time, but does that answer, <laughs> does that answer it a little bit? I think it does. I, what's interesting, though, the, the, last, the very last thing you said is that it's important that the teachers you train have a practice. And um, I'm on board with the suggestion that MBSR and its kind of derivative programs are, have become a lineage or, or an approach in and of themselves. They may have, um, you know, the Dharma as their inspiration or the Dharma recontextualized, but mm -hmm. it's, it's a toolbox that in a way stands on its own. But... Um, you uh, want the teachers that you're training to have a Dharma practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, the Dharma is in there. Um, is it just that the Dharma is a nice way uh, or, or provides the framework and, or the context or the training for the teachers to... Um, move into an MBSR context and uh, teach effectively? I think so. I mean, I think, and again, um, the practice, meditation practice, as, as it is offered to us through um, Buddhist teachings, is, um, is the practice of non-doing. And <clears throat> for those, so if we think about non-doing, I mean, that's different from, um, it's not the same as not doing nothing. And I think, you know, that's a whole different conversation. But it's this idea that uh, when, when, when we practice, so if a teacher is, is practicing non-doing, they're going to, and I don't know what kind of form their practice will take because it'll change uh, as, their, it, as their home situations change, as their work situations change. I mean, I think about my practice when I had, very, very young children and my practice now, I have more time to practice now because my children are grown. But when they were younger, my practice was parenting. I couldn't go on retreats um, and, you know, trying to get a, a I don't know, 40-minute sitting practice, let alone a 15-minute yoga practice with, you know, young children and working full-time, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't correlate so easily. So practice will change, but this aspect um, that I think it, it's so important for a, 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 an MBSR, MBCT teacher to know about is what's going on in their own minds. Because if they don't know what happens when you sit down and you still the body and then all this thinking comes up and all this emotions that are often attached to it and then there can be some body sensations, if they don't if they haven't had that experience, so if they haven't had that experience, um, they're not going to know how 
to deal with the various mind states that participants are going to talk about in the MBSR program as a result of doing the practices. Okay, so then it doesn't necessarily matter whether they have a Dharma practice, but they need, they need to have a very well-developed uh, sense of like awareness of their own reactivity, like all the sort of skills sure. that an MBSR teacher needs in general. They need to have it for themselves. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, so if there was maybe um, it's just a question of the stage of evolution of teacher training, like huh? if there was a way to train teachers without talking about the Dharma at all, mm. just like a mindfulness based teacher training, Mm-hmm. Um, it all be contained within that uh, curriculum. Is that fair? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that's already happening, Joe. Um, uh, so there are now a number of senior um, MBSR trainers and MBCT trainers um, who are offering uh, standalone mindfulness retreats for MBSR and MBCT and other mindfulness-based program teachers to, to come on retreat. Um, so already that's sitting outside the tradition that we've had for a very long time, which is to send teachers to um, re- specific retreat centers within the Buddhist tradition or the, within the traditional form of Buddhism. Right. Um, it's, it's very interesting. I just saw and I'm actually planning to register. Mm. Um, I saw a retreat at uh, Insight Meditation Society, mm. and it's an insight uh, retreat, like a Vipassana retreat, yeah. but for mindfulness-based uh, program facilitators. Yeah, yeah. Um, I so think that they've, they've been doing, they've been running that for a while. I um, I can't remember the first one they did, but I um, actually went on that one at IMS some some time ago. Yeah, and it's nice that they're so there's, there's a nice uh, meeting, if you like, um, of the traditional form meeting the contemporary form. I don't like to call it secular. So it's a contemporary form of this time in this place. Um, and the two are now having a discussion right. together. Yeah. Um, so uh, the fact remains, though, that most mindfulness teachers that are well-trained Mm-hmm. Um, develop their own practice in a Buddhist context? Most of them do. There are, I mean, there are some other contexts, um, uh, Christian contemplative traditions, but mm-hmm. yes, I would agree with, yeah, yeah. Most, most are, are um, going on uh, Buddhist retreats. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, the, the, um, the other interesting kind of question there is that... Um, for many people, myself included, uh, actually, I'm not sure that it applies to me. For many people, uh, mindfulness-based program becomes a kind of gateway into the Dharma. So yeah. um, many people do an MBSR, let's say, and then want to go deeper, want to go further, want to um, understand more about what this practice is all about. And then, again, maybe if there was more mindfulness-based programming available they might just um, follow that track. Mm-hmm. Maybe them end up in a more spiritual or more um, religious, if I can use the word, uh, context. And um, in many cases, if I can move us in this direction, um, these traditional contexts are much more explicit about um, ethics, engagement with the world, um, developing certain types of, mm, should we say values, um, compassion, um, this sort of thing. And so, how, so what's my question here? Um, I guess it's difficult to sort of, define the boundaries of MBSR or a mindfulness-based program because it very quickly 
um, bleeds over into more traditional Buddhist teachings. Is that, is that fair? How would you define the boundary? Hmm. Um, I think uh, perhaps I wouldn't even think there is a, a, a boundary that's needed. So I'm, I'm just sort of, I'm just reflecting on the word boundary, Joe. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If um, in the MBS, so if we just take the MBSR program, there are moments within that that eight week trajectory where <clears throat> there is discussion um, about how we can come to know, perceive, and understand. Uh, In particular, uh, there's a moment where we talk about we turn towards difficult communications, and we all know that difficult communications or communications, conversations that we have, because we have so many of them during the passage of a day, um, are often often difficult uh, in a variety of different Diff, you know, in a variety of different ways. There are expectations and challenges, um, and we often have an agenda uh, for these conversations. Um, you know, typically we might be listening to somebody, but we're sort of forming uh, the next question or what, or what we're going to say. And, uh, you know, in MBSR, we, we, we talk about those um, conversations and how we can come to understand the, you know, the part that is played by two people coming together in a moment of time and wanting often different things and how that can contribute to um, the relationship becoming stuck and defined by uh, often a, a conversation that's happened you know, several weeks ago, maybe several years ago, and how painful that can be when that happens because there is no fluidity, there's no adaptability, which is very much a part of what the practice points to, that we're all in process. And although we may have said things and done things um, that we later regret, there is this opportunity um, with those people um, to have a conversation that is not being governed by the past um, and doesn't produce the same kind of reactivity and therefore um, the uh, inability to to have a a, a different um, relationship with that person. And I'm not talking now about, um, uh, you know, Relationships that have that that have that have been um, uh, abusive in in any way. I, I'm just talking about the you know the the moments when somebody asks us to do something and we don't want to do it, or you know we ask somebody else to do something and they don't want to do it, or some, somebody said something to us that caused us concern and worry and um, moments of, of anxiety. So, uh, you know, I'm talking about the run of the mill conversations that we have that are often, um, quite triggering, but we don't really pay attention to them. So in that, when we turn, when that week comes, when we're turning towards the understanding how, how much conversations can add to, um, stress, we are then asking how we can reframe that. And, and how we might reframe that. And that really becomes the synthesis of the Western psychological uh, understanding of mind and the practice of, um, of mindfulness. And we bring into that conversation, into that equation, all right, so in those moments, from the uh, weeks that we've spent together learning about this practice, what can we bring to ourselves, not to the other person, because we can't change the other person, but we can do something about our own state of mind, our own state of emotion. What can we bring? What would the practice of mindfulness bring to those moments that we can offer to ourselves? And what I see in 
um, the participants that come to my programs is they 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 intrinsically know what's going to be helpful. Some people will say, "Ah, oh, I'm just going to tune into my body um, and, and just really be with those sensations. And that buys me time before I then say or do something that I will later regret. Other people will identify there's an emotional context that they can tune into. Um, and again, it, it, it buys them time to maybe act in a different way. Um, and other people will tune into the, the, the torrent of thinking. And from the practice, we'll see, well, here it is again. You know, I'm preconditioning this whole situation because of what happened a week ago or a day ago or a month ago. Um, so I think there is a very explicit teaching there that in those moments, in those specific moments, we really are asking ourselves, how can we not contribute to um, the uh, ongoing situation of difficulty or challenge with this partic particular person or in this particular context? And I think in that way, um, it really does mirror uh, the movement towards a outward manifestation um, of the practice. And then later on uh, in week seven, we, we, we turn towards how we relate to not just other um, people in our lives, but the world. So we talk about the diet that, that we take in. Um, and for me right now, this is where uh, I tend to focus is technology. Um, because we're, we're all familiar with technology. It has a uh, wonderful um, contribution that it has made to our world, um, and it is also very addictive. And it's not that we're going to stop using <laughs> technology. That's not going to happen. But we can have a relationship to it. Um, and what is that relationship? Is that relation, are we being governed by checking into our social media platforms? How often are we doing it? Um, uh, what about texts? You know, we all get these notifications, these little signals, these sounds that come into our smartphones that tell us uh, that somebody is wanting something from us, whether it's an email or a text or uh, something that's come in from a social media platform. Uh, is that governing our, our lives? Is that how we want to lead our lives? And, and so we have a discussion about that. And when, um, you know, I, I facilitate this, and, and indeed in the training programs, um, we then have to have a behavior that follows because we can have the best insight and understanding, but if that isn't behaviorally operationalized, then it's not gonna it's not gonna stick. So I will get um, you know my participants to to think about okay, well, so what will I choose um, to shift or change, and what will that look like behaviorally? And again, um, you know, the, the folks in, in, the, in the program, they come up with really wonderful examples. And these aren't like, I'm never going to open my cell phone ever again. But it's, um, you know, simple things like I'll open my cell phone and take a look at what's come in um, when I get to my desk or whether that's a home office or a, 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 an office that's outside the home or it's um, uh, a parent who's taking the kids to work, to, to school rather, and, um, you know, they're not going to open their cell phone until the, the kids are at school, whereas before they were opening their cell phone at you know, 6 o'clock in the morning and checking in. And this, these messages that come in, um, sadly, are often not uplifting or mood uh, elevators, but they they're quite negative because it's people wanting us to engage with them. So this is not our time. It's somebody else's time. And so when people begin to see this, um, 
you can then begin to get them to think about their relationship to it. And then this is very much in keeping with what the practice asks us to do, which is that we have choice. Um, and that choice is a form of self-care. So I do, I do think that there are some very explicit ways in the MBSR program that we are asking people to, to really think about not just how, certainly not how they relate to themselves, because that doesn't go far enough, but we move towards the relationship that we have with um, family and, and friends and colleagues, and then further afield now to technology. And then what about to work? Um, many of us can't change our work uh, conditions. So how do, how do, how do we relate to, to work? Is, are there some things that we can bring uh, through the practice that can offer us a shift in our perception that's enough to uh, change things a little or a lot? So um, I think this is pretty clear. Um, you know, certainly for mindfulness teachers and people that have gone through these programs, um, there's a very light touch uh, around, let's say, values again. So, yeah. the, the, of course, the, um, the primary practice is about awareness, coming into contact with some of the difficulties or the, the difficult uh, feelings that arise when... Um, we're confronting a problematic habit, let's say. Mm -hmm. And then um, we're moving towards this building a capacity for choice. Yeah. And then, as you say, uh, it's very open. It's invitational, inviting mm -hmm. people to reflect on what is important to them mm -hmm. uh, and w what is the next step for them given their own sense of what is important. And there is a light touch around in, in, these, uh, in these later sessions around self-care. Right. So I find this a very interesting edge or line to walk as a mindfulness teacher. Of course, there's the sense that um, the invitational approach as a teacher, the autonomy supportive approach as the, uh, 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 as the teacher is going to facilitate the person um, working it out for themselves. And that uh, learning tends to stick better than just hearing a lecture. Mm -hmm. But, but, um, one of the things that, that has happened, I mean, literally dozens of times over the years as I've been teaching, is that people feel that aspect of like, okay, now I have a choice, but what do I do now? Mm -hmm. um, is kind of lacking. It, it sort of feels underdeveloped for people. Um, and people are hungry for more direction. Uh, and this puts the mindfulness teacher in a particular position, which is to say, well, do I make recommendations for what they should do next, for what is important for them? Um, do I facilitate a conversation about what's important to them in general or what's important? What, what are some helpful guiding principles for behavior? Um, and so, why wouldn't we be more explicit about, like, the way the Dharma is explicit about what we ought to be doing uh, to cultivate well-being in ourselves and in the world? And I'll just um, give you a, a very brief example. Um, there's uh, some really cool research by this guy, Tim Kasser. You may have heard of him. He's at uh, Knox College in Illinois, and he's published a bunch of stuff about um, well-being uh, being uh, better attained in, um, in the pursuit of um, self-transcendent values more so than in self-enhancing values. So the self-enhancing values tend to lead people to consumer behavior um, and self-transcending values tend to um, lead people towards generosity and compassion, etc. So we know this. Mm -hmm. We know that certain choices are going to make people feel well. Mm -hmm. um, and so why such a light touch? Why can't we mobilize the facts that we, that we know that the Buddha knew 2,600 years ago? Why do we have to be so careful about all this? 
Mm. I don't know that we are careful. I mean, I, I think, and I think we need to be careful. So I think there are two things. There's a tension here that, that we're holding. And I think a, a piece of that is very much in the hands of the teacher and how, how the teacher is holding the practice. Um, so what do I mean by that? Uh, it is an act of generosity and deep compassion to sit down and turn towards yourself. I have no worries about sharing those phrases with my participants because I know that implicitly from my own practice. So I think the light, the, the, the I th the skill comes when, when it's helpful to um, make those kinds of statements because one has had that experience over and over again and you've tested it out. It's not like you have it once or twice. But you see how the act of turning towards oneself and really having a, you know, a deep understanding of what the mind can actually, um, how the mind can contribute to uh, suffering. Um, and that as we become aware of that, and as the mind starts to, you know, quieten down in stillness, you have this, um, you know, it's really the Brahma Viharas, you have this real sense that uh, the human, the, the, the nature of a human being is this deep, sense of generosity and compassion. It's right there and it just wells up through through the practice. So I think that <clears throat> you you know when you can certainly say that, um, but you you have to, to 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 have have seen how that not only um, is a uh, component or an ingredient or a a um, you know the the richness of a of a formal sitting practice, but also in your life, because the the sitting practice in and of itself is wonderful and helpful, but the pra the real practice is life, which is where I think you and I would agree. This 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 is it. That um, how that um, how the practice really asks of you for this deep engagement in the life that you've been given. Um, is is really the richness, the the, the loam, if you like, um, of of what we're all talking about. So I I don't you know I, I don't think we need to you know have a have a um, a program that is specifically geared towards um, uh, supporting and strengthening you know generosity and compassion. I mean there is the self compassion program that's already um, you know, really doing that um, in terms of specific skills around self-compassion. So I think um, there's that, and we could certainly point our participants to taking that program if that was something that they were interested about. So I don't think MBSR has to do everything. Um, I also think uh, that once... Um, once the once we begin, or once our participants, a teacher, um, is in the arc, if you like, of the eight week program, um, a skilled teacher is with an individual and, and with the group process going to be able to highlight um, these what 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 you've called these transcendent qualities. Um, but the transcendent bit, um, we have to be a bit careful about. I mean, yoga philosophy has um, this transcendent quality, you know, the sort of loss of self, if you like. Um, and Buddhism has a slight, slight, slightly different take. And I think the, the best way I can describe this is um, to borrow a phrase from um, uh, Jack Cornfield, um, after the ecstasy, the laundry, which is the title of his book, mm -hmm. uh, which I love because, yeah, it, the 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 discussion that one can have with one participants um, is is not to 
impart one's own values, a teacher's values, you know, you've got to be very careful. People come from different cultures. So they, they bring um, a different understanding uh, to, um, and different traditions. They come from different cultures, different religions. Um, they have, it's a, so it's a rich mixture. I don't think we want to, you know, impart specific values. That's not what I'd be interested in. But I am really interested in conveying the possibility through practice that we have this inherent capacity. We want to act in ways that don't contribute to our suffering or to others. I mean, it, it's a human quality. And part of that is generosity. Part of that is compassion. Part of that is loving kindness. Part of that is equanimity. And we mess up. I mean, that's the other thing. So when we talk about values, I don't want people to go on a sort of self-improvement uh, mm -hmm. course at all. I, I wish for them the very best in terms of whatever I am able to impart by using this vehicle that we happen to call MBSL. Okay, that's, um, that's really helpful. Does that help? <laughs> no, really, it is. I mean, what you're, what you're talking about, um, there are very explicit values in the mindfulness-based programs. Yes. Um, you might say that it's kind of particularly explicit in mindful self-compassion. Yep. Um, I think there's also a lot of explic explicitness in mindfulness-based cognitive therapy because it's a yes. much more focused program. Yep. Um, and I guess what one of the things I'm taking away is that um, in many ways, navigating this issue of transmitting values or not or whatever mm -hmm. comes down to the practice of the teacher yeah, and their intentions and how they see their role. Yeah. Um, and I, it, that is something I wanted to ask you about because I wanted to get back to your book, which I think is um, a really interesting um, new development in the field. First, let me just ask you, how, how do you see the role of the teacher and how do you train that? I mean, it, all the things we've, we've talked about really highlight how complex a job it is. Um, and I know it's a very broad, broad question, so, you know, yeah. feel free to share whatever comes to mind uh, <laughs> most readily. Uh, oh, goodness. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, so how do you train? How do you... Yeah, I mean, how do you go about training a, a, a teacher who's who's got this um, thing, you know, we call MBSR or MBCT? Um, and, of course, we have to. I mean, you know, there's, there's uh, we, we, we want to be able to um, have a teacher who at the very best is, is um, not going to do any harm, for sure, who knows the scope of their practice. So, uh, you know, professional um ethics and, and boundaries, and if they don't have a designated um, profession that has um, provides oversight, then they really need to know um, who they can teach to, uh, you know. So I think those would be the, the, the really basic ones. Um, so how do we, how do we, you know, how do you train a, a teacher and how long does it take? I mean, these are questions that I have wrestled with for many years now, Joe, and I still don't really know the answer. Um, uh, we, we, can, we can, what do we know? We know that, so here's what we do know. We know that we can, we can train to a protocol structure or curriculum. So if, if an eight-week program has a structure, um, that's really helpful because that's a really b good beginning place uh, for, for teachers to kind of, um, you know, put, put their hat on a hook, if you like, or they, they can see, okay, so, you know, I start with the practice, then I'm going to have a discussion about it. I know what kind of practice I need to teach. Then I'm going to introduce some kind of didactic exercise that highlights the theme for that particular week, I'm going to have a discussion about that. Then I'm going to uh, set the home assignments, and you know, if it's uh, a week where the home assignments have already been set, I'm going to talk about that. So that's really helpful, and it alleviates um, confusion and anxiety for a for a, um, a new teacher or a new train a new teacher who's training. 
so that's that's great so we can we can really rely on that and the other thing of course is it provides consumer safety if we have a curriculum or a protocol um, because the consumer knows what they're going to get to some extent but they know that it, there's going to be a form um, and if there's a form we know it can be replicated and then we can start to measure patient outcomes. So all of that is really good. Not only that, but we have inter-teacher reliability. So we can help each other because we've got a form that we can discuss and take a deep dive into. So that's what we do in the foundational training. It's one of the things we do in the foundational training. We take a deep dive into the curriculum. We go through the curriculum in detail and we take a deep dive into you know, how, how to do this. So they have that experience as a participant. And then we turn the tables and we get them to actually teach each other in dyads or in small groups with the watchful eye of two or three senior teachers who are facilitating the training. And they then get to see that what looks quite easy is actually not that easy. So they begin to see the demand um, that is part of being or becoming um, an MBSR or an MBCT teacher. And I always say in these trainings that it's not for the faint-hearted. Why? Because actually, um, unlike the usual way that we get trained, um, which is we, you know, we're, we're taken through a, a specific um, protocol and we talk about it in great detail and then we go off and, you know, actually do it. Um, what we're really suggesting to our trainees is that actually it's through the experience of um, being taken through an eight-week program and then um, turning that uh, into, okay, now you're going to be teaching this. So what's, what's, what's that uh, calling for? And that will be different for, for different people at different times. So that, I think, is relatively easy um, and then the next easy bit which is to provide some kind of supervision and mentorship while somebody is is teaching I think is is really a um, incredibly useful um, and a very good way to train people because you can help them um, learn uh, about what not to do <laughs> um, because you know that that's not helpful um, and you can support uh, what's already a strength in that individual um, and then focus on some areas that need uh, you know, some support and, and further understanding. So I think that's relatively easy. The, um, the piece that isn't so easy uh, is the developmental tra trajectory of a person's mindfulness meditation practice, and that's an unknown, Joe. Um, I've, I've had very experienced meditators come into MBSR and MBCT training and find it very difficult. Uh, and equally, I've had folks who have very limited exposure to um, practice um, just, just be naturals. So, you know, what's that about? Um, so I think, you know, that, that, that's, that's part of it. I also think that, and I mentioned this when we first started talking, uh, that when, when I first started, uh, I, I learned through delivering the program and then seeing how my participants were responding to it. And there's something about the reciprocity of this kind of teaching, which is very experiential in nature, rather than intellectual or rational or didactic, that informs the process of developing the skill of the teacher. So um, one of the things that we think about when we develop, or certainly when I developed a, a training pathway, is having a teacher teach enough of these eight week programs to have have a sense of that to have the essence of it to savor that um, so that uh, when they sort of come to the end of a training pathway and they meet up with the supervisor and the mentor again for some final mentoring um, they will have had that experience and they can bring that 
uh, to those um, you know fine, final sessions. So I think it's an open-ended question, to be honest with you, about you know how uh, what actually um, contributes to training um, a, a, a teacher, a, a mindfulness-based teacher. Um, I, what I have seen over the years is that um, over a two-year, two-and-a-half-year period of an intense training trajectory, um, that I feel I can feel very, very comfortable if I'm working, you know, with that particular person. And I've now worked with literally, I don't know, hundreds. Certainly, I've thousands I've trained, but you know, hundreds in terms of having the um, the delight, um, you know, and the responsibility of of mentoring and supervising um, teachers all over the world. That um, at the end of a period of time where they've had a foundational training and an advanced training and they've had supervision and mentorship and they have talked a number of eight-week programs, they've gone on retreat, that I am comfortable saying that this person has um, developed competency um, and best practice and is, is therefore qualified now to um, you know, teach on their own, which they've been doing uh, to a certain extent, but... Uh, um, but I also then talk to them about professional development, which is, you know, something that, again, I don't think the field has really uh, deliberated enough on, um, which is it doesn't end just because you've got a certificate or a master's degree. It doesn't end there. Uh, because, again, it, the, the principle, the, the ethics of mindfulness is that this is an ongoing process and you are not done as a teacher. You're not done as a person. You're never done. We're done when we're dead, basically. Mm -hmm. um, but um, so professional development, how are you going to sustain um, your competence? Um, do you have peers that you can meet with regularly? You certainly must continue to attend um, silent meditation retreat experience, have that. Um, uh, you know, um, attending conferences so you can keep... Uh, up with um, the latest um, shifts and movement in, in the field, um, touching base with a mentor or supervisor from time to time is really, really helpful. Don't teach in isolation um, because that just, it can lead to all sorts of things. You know? but, but, I mean, one of the things it leads to often is, is drift. So you sort of move further and further away. Um, from um, the curriculum, or not so much the curriculum, Joe, but it's the intention, the rationale, the themes that are embedded, um, you know, that are inherent in, in um, the modularity of teaching these uh, eight-week programs. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't know if that... <laughs> it's a lot, isn't it? I mean, I, I, when, I, when I hear myself saying this, I, I feel, you know, golly, it's... Um, it, this is a huge responsibility to to train future teachers. I mean, I've always felt this, and I've always felt a bit, I suppose, concerned about it. That that you know, I I found myself in a in a position to, um, you know, to think about this and to offer this. And so, you know, I as a trainer, I'm still in process too. Mm -hmm. Well, it's um, it's helpful to hear the broad strokes and sort of the framework you're using. And uh, I suppose it, it's appropriate that you would think of yourself and the process of um, teacher development as um, impermanent and in flux like everything else that we do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I think what we, you know, just to sort of, I think, so just a little sort of tangential thinking here, but as you were talking, Joe, I was thinking about the process of writing the MBCT book that I wrote with, you know, Pat Rockman and, and Evan Collins. And, you know, our sub our subheading on that book is Embodied Presence and Inquiry and Practice. And originally we were trying to find a, a title which was sort of the, the, the teaching MBCT um, as a practice, because that was really our sort of real premise. It was the ethos of, 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 
of what brought us together. And um, so, it, you know, in the book, we've tried to address some of the things that, you know, you and I have had a chance to talk about in this very brief period of time. So giving people a, like a, a framework for teaching. So how do you set the stage? You know, what are those components? And then skill building, how do you gain confidence? What are, what are the things that you can bring to um, your development as, as a teacher that we have seen over the years in um, facilitating MBSR and MPCT, but also in training teachers that, that, that seems to have been useful. So really sort of offering um, that. And then, then we got to what we, what we really wanted to talk about, which was teaching as a practice, the inner landscape. Um, which is really the heart of teaching, you know, so how can we, you know, how can we describe that? Um, and, and so we developed that in a number of, of chapters in terms of really um, expressing and fostering what we would call this embodied mindful presence. Um, the inquiry, this is the discussions that we have after every practice with our participants as a contemplative dialogue. That was the closest the word I've been using contemplative um, because it to me um, is the sort of the best that I have now of, of thinking about um, inquiry as a practice it's a reflective um, it's not a process you don't know you're not attached to any outcome you're genuinely present um, w with with the person and you're embodying um, you know, this sense of um, non-doing, but generosity and compassion, um, a time skillful action. It's a, you know, it's a big one, inquiry. And then um, how can we sustain, you know, how do, how do we sustain this for ourselves? So this is the place of personal and professional um, development. So we, we it, it, you know, we had a go. I mean, it's one of the phrases I use, Joe. We sort of had it, we had a go, um, in, in seeing if we could actually, you know, do this in, a, in writing. And, of course, the worry that the three of us have about writing is that, you know, as soon as you put something in paper, you lose that quality of the experiential because now it's in a form. Um, but we thought it was worth, you know, having a go. And, and actually, Pat Rockman and I are now embarking on an MBSR book where, we're going to try and do some similar things, not entirely the same, but again, to see if we can really capture um, the, this process of, you know, becoming a, a teacher. Um, yeah. So just a little that I just, just was thinking about, you know, what, what we've been talking about and, and yeah, it just reminded me of that, ethos around writing that the MBCT book because that's what we really tried to do in terms of setting the stage gaining confidence and skills and then the inner landscape of the teacher mm -hmm. no I was actually I, I wanted to um, get you to talk about the book and your intentions for it and everything so that wasn't mm -hmm. intentions at all it was right on target okay um, I'm aware of the time Yes. Um, we're, yes. We're, I think we're well over an hour here. <laughs> I think um, we are. Yeah. Is, is there anything else that we didn't cover that uh, you'd like to um, you'd like to talk about before we end? No, I I think we've we've had a um, you know a wonderful uh, conversation that that has uh, covered uh, quite a lot of territory, Joe. <laughs> um, yeah, which is which is delightful. Um, I, I feel it's been open-ended as well, which is which is great. So we, we haven't, you know, we haven't come to any conclusions. So for me, that that's wonderful. Um, for some people, that might be not so wonderful because mm -hmm. you know we want sometimes we want definitive answers, and, and sometimes we can give those. But uh, um, for this purpose, no, it's it's been um, it's 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 been quite lovely to. Um, be given this opportunity to to um, you know air some some of these uh, topics with you. Well, it's been quite lovely for me as well, and I, I really appreciate you taking the time. Mm. Uh, before we sign off, yeah. just tell people um, 
where they can find more information about you, information about the book, and yeah. certainly um, the training that we have coming up. You're mm-hmm. coming to Montreal. Yes. Um, and maybe you can speak about that as well. Sure. Um, yep. Well, um, so I have a website um, where you can find out what I'm up to. Um, and that website is uh, www.slwoods.com. So it's just my name. Um, and um, the book is available both uh, on Amazon right now. Um, June 1st was its publication date. So that's very exciting. Um, but also on New Harbinger's website as well, which is the publishers. And um, for those, anybody who's in Toronto, I am going to be um, at a book launch in Toronto on June the 18th. Um, And you can find out where that is uh, on the Center for Mindfulness Studies website, I believe. Um, I can't remember the actual venue. I should, but I can't. I know it's in the evening. And um, Pat and Evan and I will be there. So I think that will be fun. I think we have some music and have probably something to eat as well. Um, and then I'm going to be coming up uh, to uh, do a training in Montreal. And uh, that, I believe, is October. Is that right, Joe? Yeah, that's October. Yeah. Um, uh, so it's... It's the beginning of October, right? Yeah, I believe so. so. And yeah. we're going to have all of the uh, all the information you just uh, spoke about in the uh-huh. show notes for this uh, for this episode, so people yep. will be able to click through the links there. Okay. Um, I believe um, the training you're doing in Montreal is about inquiry. Can you yes. just briefly yes. tell us what that's about? Yeah. Not not inquiry in general, but <laughs> what the training is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so so this is a two day training. Um, that uh, Pat and I are going to be um, delivering. Um, and um, it's, it's about this, you know, how, how do we facilitate this discussion um, that's embedded in a mindfulness-based program? Um, and um, so there'll be some um, specific uh, ways that, that we will um, look at inquiry and there'll be some specific practices that uh, uh, people who come um, to it will be able to actually um, get their hands around it. So there'll be an experiential piece. There'll be a didactic piece. Um, There'll be discussions in terms of how people are working with inquiry, what they're finding difficult, what they're finding useful. So there'll be that opportunity for some peer integration which is always lovely and and um a, a joy because i think many teachers you know don't have that opportunity um and uh, it the process of the two days has a structure but both pat and i know that when we work with any given group the um the mix of the group also informs the delivery of the program so that's what makes it really exciting and very alive um, and I get to be in Montreal, which I love. So, Speaking uh, of being exciting and feeling alive, uh, yes. certainly a visit to Montreal will bring you there. Yes, yes, absolutely. Well, I, I'm lucky enough I don't live so far away um, from, from Montreal, but um, yeah, Montreal is, is a wonderful city um, in many, many, many ways. Um, um, yeah, so that, that'll, that'll be fun. So I'm really looking forward to to uh, being with you. And I guess it'll, it, it, it'll take place uh, in, uh, uh, within your organization, right? Is, it, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So it'll, it'll yeah. be at a Mindspace location. Okay. Um, and okay. it's going to be done in partnership with the Center for Mindfulness Studies in Toronto. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, and I think it, it, if somebody is in the training trajectory through the Center for Mindfulness Studies. I think it's it's part of that uh, training module as well. Yeah. But yeah. other people can come. It doesn't have you don't have to be in a um, a training pathway to, to come to the to the two day. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you so much, Susan. Again, um, this was really interesting, and um, looking forward to getting my hands on the book, and definitely looking forward to having you 
in Montreal and I'll definitely be at the training. So thanks yeah. for all of that and uh, looking forward to chatting with you again soon. All right. Take care, Joe. And thank you very much for this opportunity. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Mindspace podcast. I hope it was inspiring. If you feel the world could use a little more Mindspace, please consider supporting the podcast. The best way to do that is to leave a review on the Apple Podcast app or wherever you listen, or share your favorite episode on social media. Thanks and be well.